presentation. So uh, thank you guys. Um, yeah, so as said, my name is Avery Smith. Um, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen actually so you can uh, kind of see my presentation. Okay, great. Hopefully you guys can all see that now. Yeah, so my name is Avery Smith. I'm a data scientist with ExxonMobil. And today I'm going to be talking about data science and industrial systems. Um, I don't think my presentation, I'll have to be watching the clock, but I don't think my presentation will take up the full hour. And at the end, I hope to be able to have time for, for questions. Um, I can't see the chat right now, but if you want to throw questions on a certain slide, feel free to do so. And maybe one of the moderators will be able to, to stop me um, in the presentation. Okay, I have to throw this disclaimer on here that my, my presentation today is on my personal thoughts. They do not reflect um, any company, including ExxonMobil. Um, I also should uh, caveat that I actually work mostly on downstream problems. Um, so I understand petroleum engineers, you guys are really good at, you know, getting the oil out of the ground and transporting it, transporting it, kind of the upstream and midstream. Um, I mostly work on downstream problems. So my talk today might be leaned a little bit more to the downstream, but at the end of the day, it's all the same material and a lot of the same techniques apply, maybe just slightly different applications. Okay, so today I'm gonna to be going over, okay, first, who am I? Then we'll be covering what is data science. We'll cover why data science. We'll go over some applications. And then I'll go over some resources that can help you guys, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Hi, Avery. Um, we're yep. not seeing your screen. Oh, no, really? Yeah. Let me try one more time. I just updated my computer, so that might be it. Mm. Okay, let's see. Let's do share. So funny how uh, no matter how many times I've done this, something still somehow doesn't work. All right, let's see. Okay, it's gonna have me quit. I'll be I'll be back on really fast. No One second. Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Let's try sharing my screen. Here we go. Share. Okay, how about now? Do you see the screen now? Yes, we're seeing it now. Great. Okay, perfect. Great. Let me just pull up my presentation now. Okay, now, now you can see it. Yes. All right, great. So yeah, hi everyone, I'm Avery Smith. I'm a data scientist with ExxonMobil. Um, before that, I was a data scientist for a small company called VaporSense. Um, and as said, my undergraduate is in chemical engineering from the University of Utah. And I'm almost done with my master's in data science um, from Georgia Tech. 
Um, I really enjoy talking to people on LinkedIn. So if you have a LinkedIn, feel free to add me. Um, I also have an Instagram where I kind of do data visualization, galleries, and I have a website as well, averyjsmith.com. So you guys can feel free to check me out on any of those um, sites. Move this over here. Okay. Okay, so sorry. The agenda is who I am, what is data science, why data science, some applications, and then we'll go for some resources that can help you, and then we'll have time for questions. Okay, so what is data science? It's like this really big buzz term that you hear a lot of people talking about. You hear a lot of buzz between, you know, data analytics, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, but what actually is data science? Well, data science is using any form of data to help make better decisions. And those better decisions hopefully bring more value, whether that's value in an environmental sense or a social sense or a financial sense. You're hoping to make better choices that lead to better outcomes. And you use that with the power of data. So you can kind of see I have this Venn diagram that, that has three different circles. It's where computer science meets statistics meets like a domain or a business problem. And where you meet in the middle, that's kind of data science. Um, you can see that if you focus more on just computer science and statistics, you get this machine learning up here. If you focus on computer science with a business problem, that's called software development. That's like computer science people. Um, you have to get more of like a computer science degree. And then we see when statistics meets domain knowledge, you get traditional research. So that's just like normal controlled tests um, and yeah, traditional research. But if you have all three, you're kind of in the middle. So you're using, you know, computer science and statistics max mixed with the business problem. So in this case, for most of you guys, you know, that's a, a petroleum engineering problem. Um, whether that's, you know, asphaltine deposition in pipes or whether it's a process controls problem you know working with valves or whether it's a flow assurance problem um, you're going to, to be using statistics and computer science to try to solve those types of problems um, because you're learning you know in school right now how to solve those problems from a theoretical standpoint um, but when you get to the field you'll learn that unfortunately you know, a lot of the assumptions you've been making don't necessarily hold true. You don't know if the flow is, is turbulent or laminar. You know, you don't know all of the, the details necessarily to calculate your Reynolds values just because some of them are really hard to measure or your measurements are, are not really accurate. Um, so it's hard to measure everything theoretically. It's hard to um, also keep all those assumptions. So sometimes we can't rely on entirely, at least, on first principle models and the stuff that you know, we're taught as undergraduates. Sometimes we just have to use empirical models via data. Okay, so that's the what. How about the why? The why of data science is really interesting. Um, I think it's becoming more and more of uh, a popular topic. I think you've, hear, you've probably heard more and more about it as you've gone throughout your degree. Um, I think each year it grows a little bit. Um, people start talking about it more, but it's not always very clear um, what people are saying. It's just that they're talking about it. Um, but the why of data science, I, I kind of it's kind of in the what. It's to make better decisions. You know, life is full of decisions. Just think about when you woke up this morning. Waking up, that's a decision, number one. Number two, what time did you wake up? Number three, you know, did you brush your teeth? Did you wash your face? Number four, did you eat breakfast? You know, what did you eat for breakfast? You know, life is full of, it's just basically a series of decisions repeated over time. And some of them are inconsequential, like it probably doesn't matter how much uh, you ate for breakfast or, or what you ate for breakfast. Um, at least it doesn't matter on the grand scheme of things. Um, but some decisions are very costly, whether that's on a financial standpoint, an environmental or a social standpoint. You know, you have to make decisions that could cost millions of dollars or that can cost uh, lives or that can, you know, be a great harm to the environment. And you want to make sure you make the right choices. Um, and so we're able to use data the best that we can to run different simulations, to run risk analysis, to try to understand what is the, the optimal choice for you to make 
Um, I'll, get, I'll give one example, okay? Um, if you're, let's say someone walks up to you and says, would you rather have 100% of $100? Um, sorry, I don't know what currency you guys use, but hopefully you guys are familiar with the dollar. $100 is a decent amount. They said, you can have 100% of $100 or 50%, you have a 50% chance of getting $200. Which would you choose? Now everyone's circumstances are different, so maybe that, that plays a role. But statistically speaking, the expected value actually remains uh, at $100. So they're kind of equivalent. Um, I'll see in the chat. Oh wait, no, I didn't see in the chat. Um, anyways, so those are the type of decisions that you can make using data science. Okay, the second thing is, if we think about 2020, it's been a really crazy year. Um, there's been lots of disruptions. Um, I'm sure you guys have all been affected. I mean, we're on a Zoom call for one. Um, that's, that's pretty unusual. Um, but there's been lots of things also in the oil and gas industry that I'm sure you've heard of changes. Um, we saw oil, we saw um, WTI, West Texas Intermediate, actually flip to a negative price, as in people were paying to get rid of it um, in, I think that was probably late March. Um, so that was very unusual. We saw freight costs shoot up and then shoot down and then shoot back up. Even before coronavirus hit, we saw a very strange price war with Saudi Arabia and Russia that was really affecting the price of crude in an oversupply market. So 2020 has been a very strange year and it's basically led to a lot of economic downfall in many industries, including oil and gas. Um, you look at a lot of the stock prices, for, for different oil companies, you've seen that they've, they've fallen quite a bit. The price of oil is about half as what it was in 2019. Um, and so that's, that's a marginally challenged environment for oil and gas. Um, so it's very expensive and very time intensive to make capital investments. You know, you think about uh, an oil company, how do they make money? Well, they go, they explore, they find oil, they pull the oil up, they sell the oil. Um, but that takes a lot, millions of dollars. Um, and it takes years, you know, maybe it takes 10 years to see a return on your investment. Um, and right now we're in 2020, we're cash strapped. It, we don't have that much money. We need to figure out how to make money. And so you're seeing a drive for efficiency in the oil industry. People are starting to try to figure out how can I make money with what I've got right now? Um, and you'll, you'll continue to see that with, with a challenge, a margin challenge environment. This isn't the first time, it probably won't be the last time. Um, but capital, capital efficiency, or sorry, capital investment can be really pricey. And so finding a way to maintain that is, is very key. Another factor we're also seeing is government regulations. So there's, there's often emissions um, and environmental regulations that bottleneck your process. And so you have to figure out, okay, if, I, if the sulfur spec on this product, so this is, um, I don't know much about the upstream specs, but you know, thinking about downstream specs, if I have some, some mo gas or some gasoline and I have, uh, you know, tighter, tighter constraints on my uh, mo gas sulfur, how am I going to adjust? I don't know. Okay, and then the other thing that's happening is we're seeing uh, a really large increase in sensors, technology, computer power, and memory power. So, you know, if you think about having a phone in the past, um, it maybe had, you know, eight gigs of memory, and now you can get phones with like 256 gigs. So the chips are getting smaller, but they're, they're getting more memory on them. And that's good because we use those in manufacturing settings and engineering settings to monitor our different uh, processes. You know, we've seen 5G come online that's going to be faster um, and transmit data better than ever before. So with these new technologies, it allows us to do new things. So this is, these are kind of three reasons why we're seeing data science really take off in manufacturing and industrial systems. Okay. So then here are some examples. There's lots of examples. I can't possibly name all of the examples, um, but here are a few examples where we've seen data science be useful in industrial systems. Um, so maybe we'll start with, with uh, modeling chemical processes. 
Um, so I'm sure you guys have some classes like this. Like I said, I'm, I'm not a petroleum engineer. I don't know all your classes. Um, I did take one class um, from our University of Utah's uh, petroleum engineering masters. Um, and that was an upstream slash midstream class. So it was like, it was very broad, um, not very, not very in depth. Um, but you guys are, are concerned about, you know, what happens as I'm pulling this oil out of the earth and the pressure and the temperature change dramatically? How is the material going to react? Um, how is that going to affect my business? Um, and you, you might use first principles and Bernoulli's equation and you know, all of these different uh, first principle models to do that. Um, but like I said, in real life, the details aren't always so clear. They can be often be pretty difficult to measure. They can be uh, irreliable, they can break. Um, it's also hard to know with all of the assumptions that you, you know, you've kind of used at the beginning of your problem, like friction, if they can just be neglected. Um, and real life just is, is more messy than your homework problems. <laughs> that's, that's the uh, sad truth of it all, I guess. Life isn't like a homework problem. Um, so sometimes you're unable to use first principles. And so you can use something like uh, linear regression. So if you just take linear regression, you can say, okay, if the temperature is this and the pressure is this, you know, what is my flow going to be? If you know if you've been measuring temperature and pressure uh, across time with flow. You can come up with some sort of model to describe how flow changes with temperature and pressure. And that's a really simplified example. That's some of the, uh, the chemical modeling that you can do. Um, so you can see I have here, what happens if these conditions are met? So what happens, um, and I'm sure, I don't know if you guys study this, but the Deepwater Horizon incident is obviously one that is really talked about in the oil and gas industry. You know, they really had a high overpressure. Um, maybe if they had, I think there was probably more management issues than actual technical issues in this situation. But you could go through different scenarios and say, okay, what if the pressure drop is this? Or what if I increase the pressure drop by 10%? What if, you know, our flow increases to a certain amount? And you could run some what if scenarios to try to understand your different process. Okay. Another one is predictive maintenance. Um, so the equipment that we often use in oil and gas often needs to be replaced or fixed um, at different times. Um, and it's often going to fail. Um, that's true of a lot of mechanical processes, uh, different mechanical equipment, um, airplane turbines, um, you know, anything that really has any sort of gears um, is going to have issues and it's, need to, it's going to need to stop at some point and be cleaned. And stopping and cleaning actually usually costs money because if you think about a lot of these industrial systems, they're 24 seven operations. They're continually to go on and on every day, every second. And so if you have to stop, that costs money. Um, so you have to be able to, and if you stop unexpectedly, that costs a lot of money. And if you stop unexpectedly and you don't know why, that's even more money. So if you can be able to watch your equipment and understand when their end of life is, be able to predict, okay, you know, after 10,000 hours, this is going to break. Or after 10,000 hours, you know, we're going to see this cloth or we're going to see this pipe valve. If you can understand that, that's going to allow you to preemptively fix it um, before it actually breaks and save you a lot of time and, and time is money. Um, so being able to understand the dyna dynamics of when your equipment is going to last is, is key um, for a lot of users. Um, next, I'll go over supply chain. And supply chain is huge. Um, I don't know if they cover much in, in your guys' program. Um, they didn't cover it a ton of mine, but at the end of the day, you know, why, why are we petroleum engineers? Well, it's to sell the petroleum, it's to sell the oil. And being able to figure out where to, you know, where does your discovery go? Where do we ship the oil? Who do we ship to? What is the supply? What is the demand? You know, what, what might the ships cost? What might the transportation costs? How much inventory should I hold? I mean, these, these type of questions are, are supply chain questions. Um, and now that we have, logged historic data that's gotten easier with the increase of computers and the internet of things and memory chips. We were able to use computer algorithms to try to keep track of that more often. Um, and so we can really be able to use 
supply chain, make supply chain decisions, make smarter supply chain decisions using data science. Okay, and then finally, we're gonna have anomaly detection. And this is kind of my, my expertise. Um, as an undergrad, um, I published a paper on anomaly detection in large industrial systems. So this is probably what I know best. Um, and that is a question of, is this process acting normal? Is something weird happening? Is this the way it should be working? Um, and if not, you know, what is going wrong and why? Being able to investigate those few things. Um, so with, the, with some of the time I have left, I'd like to just go over uh, this, this point in particular, okay? Okay, so I've talked a lot for a while now, um, and I wanna hear from you guys now. Um, if you guys don't mind, um, I have the chat open in my other window here. Um, so if you guys, I'll just say hi. Um, if you guys don't mind, does anyone know what this is a picture of? Right here. Anyone recognize what this is a picture of? And if you get it wrong, it's okay. You get bonus points for, for uh, putting it in the chat. No guesses? You guys are a quiet bunch. Okay, well, you can see right here, it's labeled, you know, here's Canada and here's the US and here's a picture of the world, right? So we're, we're in a square shot of the United States, basically, the northern part of the United States. And you'll see that it's labeled, uh, well, here's Minneapolis, which is the largest city. Here's Denver, which is a larger, larger city. Um, this is in Colorado. Uh, this up here is North Dakota. So there's, what we're seeing is actually a satellite image from space at nighttime in the United States. And it's showing light radiance from the satellite. So this is, if you were at, in space at night, looking down the United States with a clear view, this is what you'd see, basically the light pollution. And so Minneapolis is a big city, Denver's a big city. So we see a lot of lights because, you know, where cities are, so is lights and electricity. Up here is North Dakota. And I've never been to North Dakota, um, but there is nothing in North Dakota. Uh, well, I guess that's not true. There's oil in, in North Dakota uh, and South Dakota, but not much else. Um, and yet we see a lot of lights in, in this region right here um, at the north part. And what that is, is actually the Bakken. So the Bakken shell activity. So in the United States, there's a lot of tidal oil, um, especially up here in this Bakken field, that ends up being, you know, a lot of our oil, a lot of our light oil and natural gas is sourced from this area. And because of that, there's a lot of lights. What type of lights, you ask? Flares. Um, so flaring, which I don't know if they, they cover in your degree, they didn't really cover. In, in chemical engineering, but flares are basically safety slash risk valve slash what happens when something goes wrong. So at a refinery, for instance, or sometimes you're just burning off natural gas because it's cheaper than trying to get rid of it another way. And if you just were to emit it into the environment, it's bad. So there's a couple of reasons why you have flares. But from a refining standpoint, usually when you have flares, it's because something's going on wrong with your refinery and instead of you know you might have a unit shut down but you don't want to stop flow because it's too costly to stop the flow you'll instead just burn that stuff into the environment so it's bad from a financial standpoint because literally you are burning money and it's bad from an environmental standpoint um, because it's not great for the environment um, so yeah as an oil company you have one goal and that is to make as much money as you possibly can while making sure you follow all the rules. Flares means you're not reaching your goal. Um, and so that's actually why you can see North Dakota from space is all of these flares all over the place, okay? But flares from a refining standpoint usually means something's going wrong. Um, not always, but that's usually what it means. Um, and so we'll call that a fault, okay? A fault is an unpermitted unpermitted deviation from normal plant behavior. Um, so what that means is basically it's when something in your plant goes wrong and you didn't really mean it to. 
So there's a couple of reasons why that could happen. I have some listed over there on the left-hand side. It could be a bad sensor. Um, it could be that they're spalling. It could be something's broken in your equipment. You know, you've had a temperature or a pressure issue. Um, you could have someone press the wrong button. There's lots of reasons why something could, could go, go wrong. And on the right-hand side, I have this chart where it kind of shows an example of what you might see at an operating desk where you have a sensor value and it appears to be in the range of, you know, maybe seven and a half. It's these green dots represent, you know, a different minute. And then all of a sudden it drops quite a bit to zero and you have these red X's. Um, and this is called a short control chart. Um, if you've taken a stats class or if you've, you've taken a statistical process control class, you might see these before. The upper control limit and lower control limit, as designated by these black dashed lines, are typically plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean. Um, and usually when it goes plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean, you know something's wrong because there's like a 99.9 or 75% chance of it staying within these uh, upper and lower control limits if it was just a random chance. Because you're always dealing with randomness. You know, Brownian motion is true for, for all um, engineering aspects, and there's always some form of randomness in your problem. But there's not going, usually there's not going to be this big of a deviation of randomness from the lower control limit to the upper control limit. So in this case, it's pretty easy to see that something goes wrong around minute 3183, maybe? Um, and it's very clear. Okay. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to show you what happens. This is one variable. So maybe this is temperature or pressure or it's a certain valve um, opening. Um, on the next slide, you're going to see a repeat, small multiples of this chart here. And I want you to see one of the sensors is going to go wrong. I want you to tell me which one it is as fast as you can. Okay. So there's going to be, I think, 25 different charts and one of them is going to go wrong. Tell me which one it is, and hopefully someone comments in the chat this time. Ready? Here we go. Okay. Anyone seen it yet? Anyone seen it? I saw it. Anyone else see it? Once again, the animation is going with time. The x-axis is time in minutes. The Y is the sensor value, and the green dot indicates it's within the upper and lower control limits. A red X would represent something bad is happening. So do you guys see where something bad's happening? We'll touch one more time, and I'll direct your focus up here. See the red X's? So this is a one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, this is 35 different graphs. I'm sorry. Out of 35 different graphs, only one went wrong, but it's really hard to see. Um, so my point is, when you have large industrial systems, you don't have one point to worry about. You don't even have 35 points to worry about. You have maybe 350 points to worry about, or even worse, 3,000 points to worry about. Um, and that can be very tricky to deal with. Um, and so when something goes wrong, and also I should mention, in this case, it doesn't look like these variables are very related. You know, if you, temperature and pressure are heavily correlated, but um, if you look, were to look at these, maybe there's not a whole lot of correlation between them. Um, so when something goes wrong, um, you have to figure out what went wrong, or first off, you have to identify something's gone wrong. Second thing you have to identify is what went wrong. And the third thing you have to identify is why it went wrong. Um, and in order to do that, it's something called multivariate fault detection. And it's not super straightforward and easy. To know how to fully under to do multivariate fault detection, you need some foundation of statistics and linear algebra. Um, and the process is this. You have to do something called PCA, principal component analysis, which is dependent on an eigen uh, value decomposition, which if you don't remember from linear algebra, that's hard to do and it's not something you do every day. And then you use Hotelling's t-squared distribution to come up with an f-distribution that represents an upper control limit 
and you do control charts off of that hotel links T squared metric. Um, and so I'm not going to get into the details of how to do that. Um, I'll, have this, I'll have this reference called Process Improvement Using Data. It's a free book online from a guy named Kevin Dunn. And in this book, it's, it's really nice, has awesome examples of, you know, some statistical process control in industrial systems. He kind of explains how to do this, um, but it's a, it's a little bit out of the scope for, for this presentation. Um, but it's really awesome, I recommend it. Okay. So with that being said, we're gonna to get towards the end of our presentation, um, but I wanna be able to help you guys know further how data science can help you guys in, in oil and gas industry. Um, number one thing to do is Google. I think that's the number one skill I learned in college actually, is to Google. Google everything. Google as much as you can. It's an awesome resource. Like we're so blessed to live in this generation where we have Google. You know, search as much as you can. So a great search would be data science in petroleum engineering, data science in oil and gas, and do some reading about it, and that will help you learn. Um, I, I know you guys are, are still in school, um, but you know, if you're really excited about this and you're, you know, you're like, oh, I love this presentation, Avery, I'm really interested in data science and analytics, don't try to be a data scientist yet. Um, Use data science in your current role. Use data science in your current industry. Figure out how to use data science techniques where you are. Where you are. This isn't a presentation that everyone should be a data scientist. It's, hey, you can use data science to help make good decisions. Um, and you don't have to be a data scientist to do that. Um, there's a lot of good software that will help you make those types of decisions that don't require a PhD in mathematics or statistics. And my next bit of advice, is do a project. Um, to really understand these types of things, I think it's best learned by doing. And obviously you guys maybe are in a place where you're like, you know, you have a bunch of data, but there's a lot of projects online that'll help you kind of explore the field and learn more. The best way to learn is by doing, and the best way to do is with a project. Um, if you do want to do some projects or you do want to do some further reading, um, I recommend these three resources for petroleum engineers. So as this is uh, an SPE meeting, um, I actually found this, I didn't know this existed, but there's actually a data science and digital engineering in upstream oil and gas. Um, that was very useful. Um, I found this today, actually. I'm gonna do some more reading there myself. Um, pretty interesting. Um, and then there's uh, Kaggle. Kaggle is an awesome data science platform that has a lot of competitions, actually. Um, and it also has uh, a lot of data sources and notebooks where you can learn. Um, so the Titanic and housing are basically like introduction to data science principles. Um, and then I selected one that is a little bit more intense and it's more of a fun project. I'll go ahead and open it up. Um, it's a project that Kaggle uh, put on, actually is a competition that Kaggle had um, that was put on by Statoil, um, the Norwegian, uh, petroleum company, it's loading here. And their problem was, you know, go back to the supply chain, go back to shipping, shipping issues with, with uh, petroleum. They kept having issues where they couldn't tell from a satellite image, they were looking at the earth and they were trying to see, is this an iceberg or is this a ship? And I guess surprisingly from space, they look quite similar. And so, they were having a hard time distinguishing between the two. I'm just gonna pull this up here. Kaggle, so I'm just gonna, we'll do this. Kaggle, uh, um, stat oil iceberg. I'll just Google. Okay, there it is right there. Um, but it's a pretty interesting problem, you know? It seems pretty simple to me. Is it an iceberg or is it a boat? Uh, and you can imagine, you know, in, in the Baltic and in Norway, um, that's kind of a, an important question. Um, so I guess my Wi-Fi is not good enough to pull it up. We'll see if it pulls up here in a second. The next, the next resource I'll give you is Towards Data Science, um, which is uh, an online publishing publication about data science. And there was a nice article there. Um, I should have listed his name, can't remember, but go ahead and click this link, Data Science and Oil and Gas Projects. I thought it was pretty interesting. Okay, so just as a recap of today's presentation, data science is using any form of data to make better decisions. 
It's important because we want to make the best decisions we can. Right now, the, the economy is really tight, and so we want to be as optimized as possible, which we can often use historic data to tell us about the future. How? We have anomaly detection, supply chain decisions, chemical processes to model, and predictive maintenance, and many more that I didn't get to cover today. And it's really fun and exciting, and I really enjoy it. It's awesome. Don't forget. So with that, we'll go ahead and uh, end the presentation formally and just open up informally to some, some questions. Um, I appreciate your guys' time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, whether you guys want to pop on video chat or pop type them in the chat, that's, that's good with me. Uh, I'm good either way. I don't know if any of the hosts um, have a preference on how we do questions. Hi. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Um, it was very informative and I'm positive we all learned something new. Uh, we, I would like to now open the floor to anyone who has questions, whether you want to ask questions, well, open your, unmute your mic and ask the questions or send it in the chat and I'll read it from there. So far I'm seeing a question here from Kimberly Puran. Yeah, um, I, can, I can take that one. Okay. It says, hi, Mr. Smith, with respect to the applications, can there uh, be more application in the oil and gas industry? I mean, can data science replace some of the operations that we conduct in order to be aware of downhole conditions and occurrences? So that's a really good question, uh, Kimberly. Um, that's something that I'm not necessarily uh, versed with too much. I haven't done too much research on it. Um, but you do see, you do see that there is also like a uh, Part of data science, I would say, or maybe part of artificial intelligence is automation and robotics. And so I have seen um, a lot of imaging, um, a lot of sub surface um, analysis with robotics, um, a lot of, you know, down the pipe analysis with, with, with video and with sensors. Um, so I, and I, I also have seen stuff with drones as well, some of the higher up towers and stuff like that. Um, so being able to understand what's happening, you know, above the earth through, through drone video analysis and through drone sensors. Um, so that's a good question. I'm not too well versed in it, um, but I know it's something that, that the industry is growing on as well. Um, I also saw your second question. What are the operational principles of data science on a general basis? Um, and that's a good question. Um, I, I should have included a, a slide on there. Um, but I, I think it would be that the, the past does not equal the future, but the past is the best representation we have. Um, and you can learn from patterns in the past. Um, so being able to, you know, make predictions about the future or try to understand a process more, you know, the data doesn't lie. The data is what the data is. And being able to understand, stand it there is, uh, is pretty important. Um, there's different aspects of data science, you know, I briefly mentioned machine learning and AI. Um, I talked about linear regression. Um, if you've learned, you know, Y equals MX plus B, and there's two different variables, that is, uh, that's, that's data science right there. Um, so there's kind of two different aspects. There's uh, one called classification and one called regression. Regression is any sort of predicting, you know, what is, what is the temperature going to be when this happens? You know, what is the price of crude going to be when uh, coronavirus ends? What is, uh, yeah, classification is more like, is this a normal operation or is this an abnormal operation? Um, you might want to classify your customers. I have high, high margin customers and low margin customers or high capacity customers and low capacity customers. You're kind of dividing things in multiple different categories. And then, of course, there's optimization. So. Are you statistically running your operation at the optimal value based on some equation based on money? Um, that's another part of, of data science. So there's, there's quite a bit um, loaded in there, um, but hopefully that answers a couple of your questions. Okay, I see Kimberly asked another question. Thanks, Kimberly, I really appreciate the questions. And if there's missing data, how should you handle that? 
That's a great question. Um, that's a whole other aspect of, of data science, I, say, I would say. And you're right, there often is missing data. So what do you do? Um, you can either try to use data science to predict the missing values. Um, you can take an average for those missing values. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, discussion about what's appropriate, and it probably changes from, from use case to use case. Thanks for the question. Oh, software. That's, a, that's another good question I didn't talk, talk about at all, Kimberly. Um, do you, actually, let me ask you guys. Do you guys take like a stats class? Um, is that, I know it was, it was kind of part of my curriculum, but maybe is that part of your curriculum? Any sort of stats class? Okay, while I'm waiting for that, hopefully someone will say yes or no. Um, I'll go ahead and answer. Um, software needed, um, it really depends on where you work and what you're doing. Um, some software, okay, we do basic statistics. Do you guys use any software for that um, to do your statistics? Um, I know like you can get like a scripting language, like Python is very versatile and that's a personal favorite for me. Um, you guys might have like something like MATLAB where you, it's maybe more traditional and engineering language. Um, R, so just the letter R, is probably the most uh, favorited scripting language by statisticians and a lot of data scientists. Um, but those are all kind of scripting and require some sort of, of programming. Um, there are some softwares like Minitab or um, SAS products. One of my favorite SAS products is Jump, JMP. You guys might have a license through your school. Um, and that's a really powerful status program that can help you uh, that can help you uh, figure out stats um, quickly. Okay, I saw another question from Adrian. What set of skills does a data scientist need the most uh, to do, wait, need the most to do what needs better statistics or software engineering or what skills? Okay, so what skills does a data scientist need to have? Um, and if we, if we were to go back to the um, original slides, let's see, the very beginning. Um, oh, went too far now. Here, the kind of, these, are the, these are the skills that a, a data scientist needs. Um, you know, you need computer science, you need stats, and you need domain knowledge. Um, a, lot of, a lot of data science is, you know, understanding stats, um, it has a lot of background in linear algebra. Um, but if you can program well, that, that's, also, that's also very nice. It's not necessarily uh, a necessity, but it's, it's pretty nice. Um, just depends on what type of problems you're working on. You also have to be an avid communicator with your business shareholders. If you aren't communicating, you're not doing it right. And so being able to kind of explain, and that, that's true of engineers in general. Um, I feel like um, a lot of engineers I know, you know, got to the field and they probably do something less technical than they may have hoped or may have thought. Um, and they become more involved in the business um, and some of the soft skills of communicating and understanding. Um, but, but also being a data scientist, you have to be detective. You have to try to figure out what's causing different things. Um, so there's, I, I know I didn't really answer necessarily a ton of the, the skills, but those are some of the, the more theoretical skills. And some of the more technical skills would be, yeah, programming. You know, if you can use Python, that'd be great. Um, SQL um, is a structured query language that's for databases. Um, I think that's a really good skill. Um, so hopefully those are some of the skills that you can, you can try to gain. Any other questions? Last chance for some questions, ask me anything you want. Okay, great. 
Well, well, once again, I, I really appreciate the chance to to get to talk to you. And if you if you if you, you know you sleep on it and you have more questions, feel free to find me on LinkedIn. Um, once again, my name is is Avery Smith. You can find me on LinkedIn, um, and I, I'd love to chat with you. Um, feel free to ask me any questions. Feel free to explore my website, AveryJSmith.com. Has some good questions on data science and in uh different applications but thanks for the opportunity appreciate your guys's time and yeah wish you well in your studies <laughs>